Paul Gauguin was a French painter, sculptor, printmaker, ceramicist, and writer, whose work has been associated with the post-impressionist and symbolist movements. While only moderately successful during his lifetime, Gauguin has since been recognized for his experimental use of color and synthesis style that allowed him to move beyond Impressionism. Traveling to the South Pacific in the early 1890s, Gauguin developed a style that married everyday observation with mystical symbolism. His rejection of his European family, society, and the Paris art world for a life apart, in a foreign land, has come to serve as a romantic example of the artist as a wandering mystic. Paul Gauguin was born in 1848, a year of revolution in Paris. His father, Clovis Gauguin, was a journalist, and his mother, Aline Chazel, a French and Peruvian descent. Gauguin's family fled to Peru in 1849 due to political instability in France, but his father died while they were traveling. Gauguin spent his early childhood in Lima, Peru, in a privileged environment, surrounded by his mother's collection of Incan artwork. In 1854, following a political upheaval in Peru, Gauguin's mother decided to return to France with her children. They settled in Orleans with Gauguin's paternal grandfather. Later, in 1861, they moved to Paris, where Aline opened her own dressmaking business. Gauguin served in the Merchant Marine and the French Navy from 1865 to 1871. After his mother's death in 1867, Gustave Rosa, a wealthy businessman, and close friend of Gauguin's mother, became his legal guardian and helped Gauguin find a job with a stockbroker in Paris. Gauguin married a Danish woman, met a Sophie Gad in 1873, and they eventually had five children together. Gauguin's interest in art was fostered by Arosa, who introduced him to the works of artists like Delacroix and Courbet. For a long time, Gauguin only remained a connoisseur and collector of other people's works, but in 1873, around the time he became a stockbroker, Gauguin began painting in his spare time. His guardian, Arosa, introduced Gauguin to artist Camille Pissarro about 1874, and Gauguin began to study under the supportive older painter, trying to master the techniques of painting and drawing. The two became close friends, and Gauguin visited Pissarro on Sundays to paint in his garden. Pissarro introduced Gauguin to various other artists, and he began visiting a studio where he could draw from a model. Soon, after Gauguin's first child was born, he moved from stockbroking to the highly paid banking business. Banking offered the advantage of regular business hours, which meant that he could spend more time painting. Gauguin was making a great deal of money by speculating on various stocks and commodities. Also, he had inherited a trust fund from his grandparents, and he earned good money in his new career, so he lived well. He became a successful Parisian businessman, a lifestyle which continued for the next 11 years. On Pissarro's advice, Gauguin began to modestly collect art. Between 1876 and 1881 he bought Impressionist paintings, including works by Edouard Manet, Paul Cézanne, Camille Pissarro, and Claude Monet. Paul Cézanne's works were his particular favorite. In 1876, Gauguin submitted a painting, Landscape from Vera Flay, to the Paris Autumn Salon, which was accepted and exhibited. In 1879, Gauguin, who was by then recognized as an avid collector of Impressionist art, was given a last-minute invitation by Edgar Degas and Camille Pissarro to show his amateur work at the Fourth Impressionist Exhibition. Due to his late inclusion, Gauguin was not mentioned in the catalogue. In 1880, Gauguin began learning still-life painting from Edgar Degas, the artist Gauguin admired most. He continued working with him on figurative work for the next six years. Gauguin was included in the Fifth Impressionist exhibition in 1880, and he spent his holidays painting with Pissarro and Cézanne, and began to make visible progress. During this period, he also entered a social circle of avant-garde artists that included Manet, Degas, and Renoir. The few critics who even noticed his work were unimpressed, 
labeling him a second-tier impressionist whose influence by Pissarro was far too noticeable. Gauguin was enraged, but oddly encouraged, as a bad review effectively cemented his status as an artist with his fellow impressionists. Still life with fruit and lemons, painted at the time, reveals the artist's natural technical skill with brush and canvas. The subject matter is also standard impressionist fare. Gauguin's rendering of the tablecloth, in particular, shows the strong influence of Cezanne, whose own still lifes used similar effects of outline and shading. In 1881, Gauguin exhibited eight paintings and two sculptures in the Sixth Impressionist exhibition. Several received dismissive reviews at the time. However, paintings such as the Market Gardens of Vaugirard, painted in 1879, are now highly regarded. One canvas in particular, Nude Study, Woman Sewing, was reviewed enthusiastically, and the artist acknowledged as a rising star. The French stock market crashed in 1882, sending France into a decade-long recession, and Gauguin lost his job. In an attempt to support his family, he unsuccessfully sought employment with art dealers. He began to paint more often, and to serve as an art broker on the side. He also sold life insurance. Anything, to make ends meet. He considered the crash to be a sign that he should quit working for someone else, and to devote himself entirely to art. Unfortunately, after the crash, the art market contracted. The art dealers were especially affected, and for a period of time stopped buying pictures from painters such as Gauguin. The artist and his family were on the poverty line. They moved to Rouen, where Gauguin believed they could live more cheaply. There was also a large Scandinavian community in Rouen into which the family especially his Danish wife, were welcomed. Though life was cheaper in Rouen, dire financial straits and slow painting sales forced Gauguin to sell off part of his art collection and his life insurance policy. Gauguin's wife was unhappy with such drastic changes. She and her children now had to live away from Paris, and they suffered from their lack of money. Gauguin refused to seek new and gainful work, and his focus on art and political activism intensified. Stress began to take its toll on the couple's marriage. Gauguin was verbally abusive to his wife, who eventually went to Copenhagen to explore job opportunities. She found work teaching French and in July 1884, moved there with their children, leaving Gauguin behind. Gauguin joined his family in Copenhagen in November, bringing what was left of his art collection with him, and taking a job as a sales representative. Gauguin, who did not speak Danish, criticized every aspect of their new home. He found working in sales demeaning, and made only a pittance at his job. He spent his spare time either painting, or writing plaintive letters to his friends in France. By the spring of 1885, unable to provide for his family, Gauguin had an emotional breakdown. Without employment, he was free to pursue his art, but his wife's family treated him with contempt. Gauguin declared the city to be unsuitable to his career and temperament, and the couple finally parted. Gauguin returned to Paris with his son Clovis, now six years old, leaving the other four children in Copenhagen with his wife. Gauguin initially found it difficult to re-enter the art world in Paris, and spent his first winter there in real poverty, and was obliged to take a series of menial jobs. He had gravely underestimated his welcome in Paris. The art world took a more pragmatic view of him, now that he was not seen as a collector with money. Also, he was looked down upon in respectable social circles, after they found he had abandoned his wife and children in Copenhagen. Gauguin lacked the funds to send his son Clovis to a boarding school, as he had promised his wife, and he had to rely on his sister Marie to step in and find the funds to pay for her nephew's tuition. In May 1886, Gauguin submitted 19 canvases to the Eighth Impressionist Exhibition in Paris. Most of the paintings were earlier works completed in Rouen or Copenhagen, and there was nothing really novel in his new works, 
although his women bathing introduced what was to become a recurring motif, the woman in the waves. His own works won little attention however, being overshadowed by Georges Seurat's enormous work, A Sunday on La Grande Jatte, 1884, which was shown at the same exhibition. Gauguin spent five months during the summer of 1886 living in the artist's colony of pont Ova in Brittany, far from the urban sophistication of Paris. The village had been recommended to him as a painter's paradise and as a cheap place to live. The region's wild and primitive nature appealed to him, and the local culture, which was steeped in Roman Catholic faith, Celtic folklore, and traditional Breton language and dress, provided a stark contrast to life in Paris. While there, Gauguin painted with a group of artists who were part of what became known as the Pont of our School. It was not a specific group at a precise moment in time, but rather a collective of artists who had been drawn to the village over several decades, starting in the 1850s. Today, the term Pont of our School is associated with the works of art influenced by the area, and in particular, in the period when Paul Gauguin arrived in July 1886. Many art students visited the area, including Charles Laval, who became a friend and admirer of Gauguin. In a still life resembling the work of Cézanne, Gauguin included a side profile of Laval at the edge of the picture, looking at the fruit displayed on the table. Gauguin wrote to his wife shortly after he arrived. I work hard here, and with success, he said. I am respected as the best painter here. That doesn't bring in a penny more, but perhaps it will help in the future. Gauguin's work, Four Breton Women Painted at the Time, shows a marked departure from his earlier Impressionist style. Naturalistic tones of landscape coexist with larger expanses of pattern and color that begin to suggest a symbolic importance to the subject lying beyond what is immediately visible. In this synthetic work, Gauguin fuses elements of visual accuracy with distortions of design and composition. Faces, figures, clothing, and landscape all suggest the girl's mystical union with nature. While in Brittany, Gauguin mainly painted landscapes, such as the Breton Shepherdess, in which the figure plays a subordinate role. His painting, Young Breton Boys Bathing, introduces a theme he returned to each time he visited pont Ova, and clearly shows the influence of Degas in its design and bold use of pure color. In the spring of 1887, Gauguin and his friend Charles Laval hatched a scheme to get rich quick in Panama. The French were pouring tons of money into building the Panama Canal, and Gauguin believed there was a ready market for his paintings there. In April 1887, after a harsh winter in Pont Ova, the pair sailed to Central America. Gauguin wanted to purchase land of his own on the small Panamanian island of Toboga, where he intended to live like a savage on fish and fruit, and for nothing, without anxiety for the day, or for the morrow. By the time his ship reached the Panamanian port city of Colón, Gauguin had run out of money and had to find work as a laborer on the French construction of the Panama Canal, which started in 1882. After discovering that land on Toboga was priced far beyond reach, and after falling deathly ill on the island, where he spent time in a yellow fever and malaria sanatorium, he decided to leave Panama. Gauguin and Laval sailed for the French colony of Martinique in June 1887. They disembarked at the port of Saint-Pierre, and the pair spent several months there. His works painted on Martinique, such as tropical vegetation, and by the sea, reveal his increasing departure from Impressionist technique during this period. He began using groups of colors that are next to each other on the color wheel to achieve a muted effect. While staying in St. Pierre, Gauguin became seriously ill with dysentery and malaria and moved into a hut, living off the kindness of the islanders. In June 1887 he wrote to his wife Meta, saying, We are both currently housed in a thatched hut, and it is a paradise compared with Panama. Below us lies the sea, edged with coconut palms. Above us, all kinds of fruit trees, 
and we are a 25-minute walk from the town. In the two artists' sketches and paintings, the women appear to be dancing and singing as they work, as if life in Martinique were one long holiday. Gauguin and Laval were sticking to the European tradition of depicting the colonies as an exotic paradise, which is how they saw it. The harsh reality of hard work and low wages for the island's inhabitants, who had only been released from slavery 40 years earlier, remained hidden. While in Martinique, Gauguin produced between 10 and 20 works, and traveled widely. His depictions of the natives in their natural environment suggest serenity and a self-contained sustainability. The works as a whole are brightly colored, loosely painted, outdoor scenes. Even though his time on the island was short, it was influential in changing Gauguin's style. Gauguin's stay in Martinique ended up being his first step toward primitivism, a style of art that would become the focus of his work for the rest of his life. Gauguin wrote of his new work to an artist friend, I had a decisive experience in Martinique. It was only there that I felt like my real self. Gauguin explained the enormous step he had taken away from Impressionism, and that he was now intent on capturing the soul of nature, the ancient truths and character of its scenery, and, its inhabitants. Gauguin returned from Martinique to pont au in November 1887. Artists Charles Laval, Émile Bernard, and Paul Serracia, who were also seeking more direct expression in their painting, joined him there. In discussions, the group felt that traditional European painting lacked symbolic depth. By contrast, the art of Africa and Asia seemed to them to be full of mystic symbolism and vigor. Gauguin believed that these societies might be more genuinely spiritual, more in touch with the elemental forces of nature, than their European and American counterparts. What Gauguin was searching for was a reasoned and frank return to primitive art, and, to move beyond Impressionism, and its studies of light and nature. Inspired by Japanese woodblock prints, he began to experiment with simplified forms and strong colors. His human figures at the time, particularly their naivety and the compositional austerity, also began to reflect the Japanese influence. In his painting, Fruits, we see a definite shift in Gauguin's style. The young girl in the top left corner is far more simplified than his earlier paintings of children. She has become a symbol for temptation, looking at the beautiful fruit before her, she is contemplating her next move. Gauguin used the same color in different intensities throughout the canvas, a technique he learned from Cezanne. Gauguin now no longer used line and color to replicate an actual scene, as he had as an impressionist. He explored the capacity of those pictorial means to induce a particular feeling in the viewer. He worked closely with his friends, developing the style which emphasized the two-dimensional flat patterns that would soon lead to the birth of post-impressionist art. This bold use of pure color and symbolist subject matter distinguish what is now called the pont of our school This work, from his stay in Brittany, represents a transitional stage from the Impressionist style to his own more plainer forms. While the palette is subdued, and the touch resembles that of the Impressionists, each form of the separate objects is expressed in large color blocks, edged by outlines, clearly foreshadowing the style that would emerge later in his work. In the summer of 1888, Gauguin painted vision after the sermon. In this Breton landscape, Gauguin employed bright areas of color, surrounded with heavy dark outlines that give the painted surface the appearance of medieval enamel and stained glass. Gauguin coined the term synthetism to describe his style, which emphasized the synthesis of the artist's memory and feelings, using bold pure colors, the absence of perspective and shading, and, a geometric composition devoid of unnecessary details. In 1887, Gauguin's Martinique paintings were exhibited at the Poitiers Gallery, where they were seen and admired by artist Vincent van Gogh and his art dealer brother Theo. Theo purchased three of the paintings for 900 francs, and arranged to have them hung at his gallery, where wealthy clients might see them. At the same time, Vincent and Gauguin became close friends, 
and they started to correspond with each other on art. Early in 1888, Vincent van Gogh moved to Arles, hoping to found a studio of the South, where like-minded painters would gather to create a new personally expressive art. In June of that year, Theo offered Gauguin monthly payments of 150 francs, in exchange for one painting a month, if he went to live with his brother Vincent van Gogh in Arles. Gauguin sent van Gogh a self-portrait. He painting himself as the main character of the Victor Hugo novel, Les Miserables. He described the work as depicting the misunderstood artists of his time. The cheerful floral pattern on the wall was Gauguin's way of testifying to his artistic virginity. Late in October 1888 Gauguin traveled to Arles, and the two men lived and worked together for nine weeks in Van Gogh's yellow house, where Vincent's brother paid the rent. The two set up an ambitious painting schedule, despite it being the wettest weather on record. When it rained, the two painted inside a café, the scene for Gauguin's painting, Café et al. Painting together, they turned out an impressive number of canvases, often of the same scenes. On more than one occasion, they set their easels up side by side to paint portraits, for example, Augustin Roulan, the postman's wife. While Van Gogh rapidly completed his painting with large brushstrokes, Gauguin took his time, using washes of flat bold colors that almost resemble Japanese woodblock prints. Gauguin experimented with Van Gogh's technique of completing a painting in one sitting. This was very different from his usual approach, which involved working over many sessions, however, the result was a pleasing more energetic, and freer portrait. The rapid brushstrokes of old man with a stick emphasize the sunburnt skin of the sitter, particularly his roughened hands, from years of manual work. The two volatile artists often engaged in heated exchanges about art's purpose. By the end of nine weeks, Van Gogh's depressed and occasionally violent emotional episodes led to the breakdown of their artistic partnership. The Dutch painter's mental health was rapidly deteriorating, and Gauguin decided he ought to leave. Distraught, Van Gogh, who worshipped Gauguin, confronted him with a razor. Reportedly, later that evening, Van Gogh cut off his ear and gave it to a woman in a brothel. Vincent was hospitalized the following day, and Gauguin left Arles and never saw Van Gogh again, but they continued to write to each other from then on. In 1889, the owner of the Volpini Café agreed to an art exhibition for the opening of the café. The exhibiting artists, including Paul Gauguin, Emile Bernard, Charles Laval, and Emile Schaffnecker. They called themselves the Impressionist and Synthetist Group. Gauguin displayed several paintings, including one showing Breton girls dancing in a meadow outside of Pont Ova. This painting exhibits two key characteristics of the Pont Ova school. Primitivist themes, featuring rural and peasant subject matter, and, a synthetist style, consisting of simplified drawing, clearly defined contours, intensified colors, and flattened space. The Volpini exhibition was not commercially successful, but it was the first public presentation of artwork from a synthetist group. In 1889, after finding Pont Ovar overrun by tourists, Gauguin stayed instead at the nearby seaside village of Le Pouldieu. Cut off by a river and huge dunes, it provided the peaceful isolation Gauguin was looking for. Free of distraction, he began working with flat areas of color and bold outlines, reminiscent of medieval enameling techniques. Gauguin's painting, The Yellow Christ, is a typical example. Here he pays little attention to classical perspective, and has boldly eliminated subtle gradations of color, two of the main characteristics of post-Renaissance painting. In a move away from earlier religious painting, Gauguin places the scene in the north of France during the peak season of autumn foliage, with women in 19th-century Breton garb gathered at the foot of the cross. Gauguin is said to have chosen the color yellow to convey how he felt about the isolated life and piety of the peasants, kneeling at the foot of the cross during the evening hour of Angelus, a Catholic prayer recited daily at 6 a.m., noon, 
and 6 p.m. Continuing the religious theme, Dogan often used himself as a model for paintings that were not necessarily intended to be self-portraits. On more than one occasion, he painted himself as Christ. Gauguin's features are highly recognizable in this painting, and his expression demonstrates Christ's anguish and distress. When he painted this work, Gauguin was struggling to sell his paintings, and felt isolated and persecuted by the art world. By using himself as the model for this biblical event, Gauguin communicated his own sense of suffering. By 1890, Gauguin began to long for a more remote environment in which to work. After considering and rejecting northern Vietnam and Madagascar, he applied for a grant from the French government to travel to Tahiti. A successful auction of paintings in Paris at the Hôtel Drouot in February 1891, along with other events such as a banquet and a benefit concert, provided the necessary funds. The auction had been greatly helped by a flattering review from an art critic Gauguin met through Camille Pissarro. Gauguin managed to raise almost 10,000 francs. Needless to say, his wife and his children did not get a share of the money, but the artist arranged a grand farewell banquet for his friends. He also left without regret, his model and mistress, Juliette Hewitt, a young seamstress he met in Paris in 1890, who had lived with Gauguin and was expecting his child at the time. Hewitt had modeled for Gauguin's painting, The Loss of Virginity, shown here. After visiting his wife and children in Copenhagen, Gauguin set sail from Marseille for Tahiti on April 1, 1891, with the support of a government subsidy to study and paint the customs and landscapes of the French colony and, as he put it, to begin his exile into savagery. Gauguin arrived in Tahiti on June 8, ill with bronchitis. He spent the first three months in Papieti, the capital of the island, which had already changed under the influence of French colonists. His romantic image of Tahiti as an untouched paradise was shattered, and he was disappointed by the extent to which the colonists had actually corrupted the island. Also, one of his first projects, a commissioned portrait of socialite, Suzanne Bambridge, had not been well received. Gauguin found himself a local French-speaking guide, and visited the wilder part of the island. There, the artist finally found the life that he imagined in his fantasies. He set up his studio in an isolated village by the sea, some 45 kilometers from Papieti, installing himself in a rented bamboo hut near the beach and began to paint portraits of local women in exotic clothes and idyllic landscapes dazzling with unnaturally bright colors. Here, he executed paintings depicting Tahitian life, using Tahitian titles, such as By the Sea, and Ave Maria. The latter would later become his most prized Tahitian painting. Although France's colonial impact had washed away some of the qualities he had hoped to find, Gauguin nevertheless was productive, and his works from this time depict natives, almost all of whom are women, in an ideal, unspoiled Eden. These works, characterized by vivid colors and symbolist themes, would prove highly successful among the European viewers for their exploration of the relationships between people, nature, and the spiritual world. Gauguin's experiences in Tahiti deeply influenced his art and personal philosophy, as he sought to immerse himself in the local culture, and live according to what he considered to be more genuine and simple values. His writings and artworks reflect his complex and often romanticized view of Tahitian life, which he contrasted with the corruption and decadence of European society. His first portrait of a Tahitian model is thought to be Woman with a Flower, which depicts a Tahitian woman in European dress, capturing the fusion of European and Tahitian cultures, and the impact of colonization on the native people. The woman in the painting is a composite of the local Tahitian women, many of whom served as models for Gauguin's art during his time in Tahiti. By late summer 1892, this painting was being displayed at a gallery in Paris. Tamana, also known as Tahura, was around 13 or 14 years old, 
when she first met Paul Gauguin and became his native wife. She was innocent in every sense, but most importantly to Gauguin, the girl was not spoiled by civilization. The artist met Tahura during an excursion around the neighborhood, and he married her the same day. Interestingly, according to local traditions, Tahura had both biological and adoptive parents, and Gauguin had to negotiate a marriage with each of them. These marriages were often made by the family to enhance status or financial standing in the community. However, as a foreigner, Gauguin also would have profited in terms of access to fresh local food, and a sexual partner. Tahura appears in one of Gauguin's most famous works, where he combines the ordinary with the mystical in a single canvas. Returning home late one night, the artist found his wife, naked in the tropical heat. She was startled by him striking a match in the darkness. Gauguin captured the luminous, unreal look of the scene, all suddenly illuminated by the momentary flare of the match. The ghostly depiction of a watching female spirit at the foot of the bed is a direct reference to a local legend, describing spirits roaming the night, and forever sharing the world of the living. Gauguin soon found that living in Tahiti was not the idyllic life he had envisioned. Expecting to live frugally, he quickly discovered that food and imported art supplies were very expensive. He sometimes went hungry. He soon ran out of money and went into debt. The natives he idealized and expected to befriend were happy to accept his gifts to model for him, but they didn't accept him. There were no buyers for his paintings in Tahiti, and he felt his name was fading into obscurity back in Paris. He fell ill and was obliged to spend some time in the hospital, but even after he got out, his health was not good. After two years, he missed his artist friends and their conversation. He longed to be with his family in Europe. He was homesick and indeed, had grown tired of the exotic atmosphere. He endured moments of true desperation, when he thought he had failed, and even wrote of giving up painting entirely, since it would not yield him a living. But, his obstinate spirit took over, and he determined to do his duty to the end. In December 1892, Gauguin sent nine of his paintings to his friend, George Daniel de Montfred in Paris. Gauguin listed his paintings in the exhibition catalogue in Tahitian so that his wife could not understand the titles. These were eventually exhibited in Copenhagen, in a joint exhibition with the work of the late Vincent van Gogh, at the Free Exhibition, a venue known for showcasing modern artworks. Even though only two of the Tahitian paintings were sold, and his earlier paintings were unfavorably compared with Van Gogh's, Gauguin was sufficiently encouraged to contemplate returning to Europe with some seventy other works he had completed in Tahiti. He had, in any case, run out of funds, and had to depend on a state grant for a free passage back to France. In addition, he had been diagnosed as having heart problems by the local doctor. In June, Gauguin left his native wife, Tahura, who was about to give birth, and arrived in Marseille in August, 1893. By the time he returned to Tahiti in 1895, Tahura had married a local man, with whom she brought up Gauguin's child. Gauguin returned to France penniless and sick, but shortly after his arrival in Paris, the uncle with whom he had lived as a child in Orleans died, and left him some money. For the first time since he had become an artist, he found himself able to live with a certain ease, and he took full advantage of it. He rented a large studio in Montmartre, decorated the walls in brilliant chrome yellow, and hung them with his own Tahitian pictures. The decoration included numerous Polynesian works, which he had brought back, especially idols carved in red, orange, and black wood. He gave weekly receptions, which became famous, gathering together artists, writers, and musicians. He affected an exotic persona, dressed in Polynesian costume, and lived in his studio with a woman known as Anna the Javanese, as well as a parrot, and her monkey. Anna, a teenager he had found wandering in the street, soothed his nostalgia for faraway lands and races. Despite her exotic name, 
Anna was in fact Singhalese. This painting shows Anna, naked, but regal, on a high-backed Chinese chair, with her pet monkey tower at her feet. In 1893, Gauguin began writing a travel journal he called Noah Noah, which means fragrance in Tahitian. In it, he chronicled what he called his transition in Tahiti from a civilized to a more primitive, spiritually connected state. Originally intended as a commentary on his paintings, and to describe his experiences in Tahiti, it was to be displayed at an exhibition of his Tahitian paintings in November 1893. However, the book was not completed in time for the exhibition. Gauguin added woodcut prints to his original document in early 1894, and he gave it, complete with drawings, watercolors, and photographs, to his friend Georges Daniel de Monfred, who later donated the manuscript to the Louvre Museum. In 1926, an exact copy of Gauguin's Noah Noah manuscript, which included his handwritten text and pasted in prints and drawings, was created by a German art historian in a limited edition of 400 copies. Modern critics have suggested that the contents of the book were in part fantasized and plagiarized. When describing his life with his native wife, Tahura, the artist spoke of her telling him stories of local legends and religious rituals. These claims were later refuted. Legends were kept secret from women in Tahitian culture. The stories in Noah Noah appear to be fantasies dreamed up by Gauguin himself. Despite his hardships in Tahiti, Gauguin had managed to paint over 40 canvases in two years. His friend, Edgar Degas, appreciated these new works, and convinced the art dealer Durand Rule to mount a one-man show of Gauguin's Tahitian paintings in his gallery in Paris. Gauguin is shown here posing at the exhibition in front of his painting The Brooding Woman. The show was a comparative failure, with the Parisian public unable to understand or appreciate his paintings. Of the 40 canvases displayed, just 11 were sold. The exhibition received mixed reviews. Among those mocking were Monet, Renoir and former friend, Pissarro. Degas however, praised his work, purchasing The Brooding Woman, and admiring the exotic sumptuousness of Gauguin's folklore. Despite the sales he made in his November exhibition, Gauguin subsequently lost Durand Rule's patronage. This was a tragedy for Gauguin's career. Amongst other things, he lost the chance of an introduction to the American market. While the exhibition was not a financial success, it caused a great deal of talk and curiosity. Gauguin's name now became well known among the people interested in modern art. He delighted in this new reputation, and deliberately cultivated the exotic and eccentric aspects of his personality. This self-portrait, painted from a photograph, shows him with a moustache added, in the strange costume he affected at this time, which included a high astrakhan hat and a flowing blue cloak. He had become the center of attention which was very satisfying, after the solitude of the islands. He created an art space in Paris, which he called the Studio of the South Seas. The name was reminiscent of many such spaces created in European capitals by explorers upon their returns to civilization. During the next two years in Paris, although he continued to paint, Gauguin developed a diverse artistic practice that included writing, printmaking, sculpture, ceramics, decoration, and architecture. In 1894, Gauguin returned to Brittany, where he established himself as the leader of the Pont of our school, surrounded by artists who saw him as their mentor. He presented himself to his admirers as a kind of artist explorer, surrounding himself with musicians, writers, painters and other cultural hangers-on, stimulating his artistic ego as well as promoting his art. After drinking in a nearby town, Gauguin got into a fight with some sailors, resulting in a broken ankle, which kept him inactive for four months, and left him penniless again. While Gauguin was nursing his injuries, his mistress, Anna, left him and returned to Paris where she ransacked his studio, stealing everything of value. 
she then disappeared. The prolonged inactivity, the suffering, and the return of poverty threw Gauguin into a despondent mood. He began to realize that his glory days in Paris were behind him. His isolation had become so bitter that he decided to leave Europe forever. He believed he had no choice but to try to reclaim his place in Tahitian society. By mid-1895, attempts to raise funds for Gauguin's return to Tahiti had failed, and he began accepting charity. A friend arranged a cheap passage back to Tahiti for him, and in June 1895, he left France for the final time, and never saw Europe again. On his return, Gauguin found Papieti had lost many of the qualities that had formerly attracted him. Electricity was now everywhere, and an amusement park had been installed in what had once been the royal gardens. Hoping to begin again where he had left off, Gauguin tried to re-establish his relationship with Tahura by means of generous gifts and jewellery, but the girl refused. She had married a local man, and now had two children, one of them Gauguin's. Unhappy in Papieti, Gauguin rented land in a village in the western part of the island, where some of the original flavor still lingered. He built a spacious reed and thatch house in an affluent area ten kilometers from Papieti, in which he installed a large studio, sparing no expense. He continued to live his Tahitian version of a bohemian life, starting a relationship with Pahura Atai, the daughter of one of his neighbors. The relationship began when Pahura was 15 years old. He stayed with her for six years. He fathered two children with her, of which a daughter died in infancy. The other, a boy, she raised herself. His descendants still inhabit Tahiti. During this early part of his second stay, he painted some of his best work, the monumental and strong, Why Are You Angry? and Maternity, which is full of tenderness and a really lyrical quality, and maybe his wife Pahura and son Emil. Gauguin was pleased with these works, and with what he described as their deep-toned key. The combination of resplendent sensual form and color, with a strange enigmatic mood, shows Gauguin at his very best. During this period, his friends in Paris and dealer Amboise Vollard made it possible for Gauguin to enjoy periods of prosperity. He was able to support himself with an increasingly steady stream of sales, though there was a period of time, between 1898 and 1899, when he felt compelled to take a desk job in Papieti, working for the Office of Public Works and the Land Registry. In 1897, Gauguin learned he had to vacate his house because its land, which he was renting, had been sold. He took out a bank loan to build a much more extravagant wooden house, with beautiful views of the mountains and sea. But he overextended himself, and faced the real prospect of his bank foreclosing on him. Gauguin's daughter, Aline, died of pneumonia in January 1897, and he received the news in April. Gauguin, who had spent about seven days with Aline over the past decade, blamed his wife, Meta, and sent her a series of accusing and condemning letters. Over the summer, plagued with financial worries and increasingly bad health, Gauguin began to fixate on Aline's death. He developed double conjunctivitis and did not work for two months. Driven by sorrow and misery to complete despair, he decided to kill himself. Before doing so, he wanted to paint one last great work that would summarize everything he had done. He created the large fresco-like painting entitled, Where Do We Come From? Who Are We? Where Are We Going? The work is made up of elements from many of his other pictures. And, of all his works, it is the closest to the spirit of symbolism, with its strange inscriptions, inscrutable figures, muted colors and the deliberate awkwardness with which it is painted. The painting was exhibited at Vollard's Gallery in Paris in November 1898, along with eight other paintings he had recently completed. The show was a decided success, and critics praised his new serenity. Where Do We Come From However, received mixed reviews, and Vollard had to wait until 1901 before he finally sold it for 2,500 francs. 
After finishing his picture, Gauguin went up into the mountains and took arsenic, hoping to die there. His efforts failed, and he staggered back to his house, his health once more shattered. Unable to die, unable to work, and with no money, he was obliged to stop painting altogether, and to seek employment at very low wages, in a local real estate office. In 1899, Gauguin's Paris dealer died. Voila, who had been buying Gauguin's paintings through the dealer, now made an agreement with Gauguin directly. The contract provided Gauguin a regular monthly advance of 300 francs against a guaranteed purchase of at least 25 unseen paintings a year, at 200 francs each, and in addition, Vola undertook to provide him with his art materials. Feeling more relaxed, Gauguin departed from his usual symbolist style to paint portraits of Tahitian women, whose beauty, form, and lack of shame at their partial nudity at once fascinated, attracted, and inspired him. In these works, we see a return to a style that would have endeared him to the colonists of the time, who were now anxious to preserve what was left of native culture by stressing the similarities between natives and Europeans. With his finances now stabilizing, Gauguin was finally able to realize a long-cherished plan, to resettle in the Marquesas Islands, 1,600 kilometers northeast of Tahiti, where he hoped to find an even more primitive society. Despite his earlier experiences, he was hopeful that this was to be the dreamt of primitive paradise, where living cost nothing, nature was beautiful, and the people, loving, happy and free. When she heard of his plans, his native wife Pahura, refused to move away from her family, and she moved out, and left him. Gauguin sold all his belongings and sailed to the Marquesas, disembarking at Hiva Oa, the second largest of the islands, where he settled in the village of Atuona. He soon took another native wife, Vioho, who he called Marie Rose. She was the 14-year-old daughter of a native couple who lived in an adjoining valley. She lived willingly with him, and the following year gave birth to a healthy daughter whose descendants continued to live on the island. Gauguin bought a plot of land in the center of the town, and with the help of his neighbors he built a two-story house that he called the House of Pleasure. The ground floor was open air, and used for dining and living, while the top floor was used for sleeping and as his studio. Although Gauguin may have been constantly in need of more money, he intermittently had plenty, and spent it lavishly. He lived surrounded by native girls, avid for the presents they expected in return for their favors. His bedroom was decorated with erotic drawings and paintings. We know from financial accounts that he spent large amounts on wine and liquor. We also know that he used morphine to alleviate the pain in his legs. During the first months he spent in Atuona, his new environment seemed to give him strength and inspiration to work again. His pictures are bright and cheerful. His palette changed, his color harmonies became cooler and more brilliant than ever. In such paintings as The Call and Riders on the Beach, there is a new restless and exciting quality, quite different from his earlier brooding moodiness. He began a period of productive work, sending 20 canvases to Vola the following April. In the paintings produced on Hiva Oa, Gauguin seems to have attempted a reconciliation between his Western past and the more spiritually enlightened Polynesia. Nowhere is this more evident than in his painting, Barbarian Tales. The West is represented here by the figure of the painter Maya Dahan, a friend of Gauguin, who accompanied him to Brittany, but for health reasons, could not follow him to the South Pacific. The liberty that Gauguin has taken with this portrait, and the suggestion of a demonic aspect to Dahan's character, implies a West that is necessarily corrupt. The Orient, on the other hand, is represented by two stoical Polynesian figures, one of whom sits in a classic Buddhist pose, perhaps a meditation on the perpetual cycle of life, and the possibility of rebirth. In the Marquesas, Gauguin found a society that had lost its cultural identity. Of all the Pacific Island groups, the Marquesas were the most affected by the import of Western diseases, especially tuberculosis, 
and the local population had declined to just 4,000 people. Catholic missionaries held sway, and in their effort to control drunkenness and promiscuity, obliged all native children to attend missionary schools into their teens. French colonial rule was enforced by a gendarmerie noted for its malevolence and stupidity, while traders, both Western and Chinese, exploited the natives appallingly. There is no doubt that Gauguin had constant trouble with the authorities, both religious and secular. Many letters and reports written by him prove this. These quarrels must have been terribly time-consuming, and are surely one of the main reasons for his small output of painting. But, Gauguin himself was responsible for most of this trouble. He enjoyed defying and badgering people in authority. During this period, he seems to have devoted a great deal of time to writing. His letters reveal that he was reflecting deeply, and their thoughtful tone contrasted with earlier letters filled with complaints and material preoccupations. He composed a serious study of the problems of religion and the Roman Church, called the Modern Mind and Catholicism. It was at this time, too, that he wrote his most interesting book, Before and After, a freely flowing stream of anecdotes and recollections, imaginary situations and analyses of his own inner feelings, expressed in a style that anticipates surprisingly the literature of the mid-twentieth century. After Gauguin's death, the rights to the document reverted to his wife Meta, and it was not published until 1918. In July 1902, Marie Rose, by then seven months pregnant, left Gauguin to return home to a neighboring valley to have her baby amongst family and friends. She gave birth in September, but did not return. From then on Gauguin did not take another native wife. Gauguin's health took a decided turn for the worse and he was hospitalized several times for a variety of ailments. His shattered ankle had never healed properly, and painful and debilitating sores that restricted his movement began erupting up and down his legs. These were treated with arsenic. Gauguin blamed the tropical climate and described the sores as eczema. Some have suggested that he was suffering from syphilis, but there is no direct evidence that this was so. Gauguin's wives and children showed no signs of the disease. Gauguin's legs were a constant source of pain, making it impossible for him to move freely, and forcing him to paint only in his studio. The pain in his injured ankle was also increasing. By September his agony was so extreme that he resorted to morphine injections. His sight was also beginning to fail him, as indicated by the spectacles he wears in his last known self-portrait. It was at this time that he painted one of his last works, Still Life with Parrots. The dead fowl and plucked flowers symbolize man's fleeting life on earth. The bright colors and rich brush strokes contradict the still life's gloomy symbolism. Paul Gauguin died in Atuona, Marquesas Islands, on May 8, 1903. He was 54 years old. The cause of death was recorded as a heart attack, probably brought on by a morphine overdose. He was interred in Calvary Cemetery the next day, though he was denied a Christian burial, as he had upset many of the island's missionaries. In 1973, a bronze cast of his sculpture, Aviri, was placed on his grave, as he had wished. It was not until three and a half months later, at the end of August 1903, that the news of Gauguin's death was announced in France, an event that had until then passed unnoticed. The art world had become accustomed to the artist's absence, and almost all had forgotten him. A number of Parisian newspapers confined themselves to announcing Gauguin's death in three or four lines. One newspaper wrote an article which portrayed Gauguin as an anarchist, a man with no morals, who had abandoned his family, a sexual obsessive, and an alcoholic and morphine addict. This judgment tarnished the painter's image and any appreciation of his work in France at the time. In October, a few of his paintings were hung in a small poorly lit room at the Autumn Salon in Paris. A few days later, a major exhibition opened at the Galerie Vollard, 
comprising 50 pictures and 23 drawings and monotypes. Vorla had waited for Gauguin's death before speculating on his work. It was not until three years after Gauguin's death that a large-scale retrospective of the artist's work was held at the 1906 Paris Autumn Salon. Numerous collectors participated in the event, supplying a total of 227 works representing all periods of Gauguin's activity. Vorla loaned many works to support his artist's ever-rising reputation. Pictures bought for 200 francs during Gauguin's lifetime were now selling for several thousand. The exhibition revived hopes for a rehabilitation of the artist, who was still officially ostracized in France. He was already appearing alongside Cézanne and Van Gogh as a major player, and a profound influence on contemporary art. But the public at large, for whom Gauguin was practically an unknown, still feared his reputation and preferred the works of other artists. During the following years, galleries and dealers proved extremely committed to Gauguin, whose popularity was continually rising. Around 1910, a medium-sized canvas cost between 10,000 and 18,000 francs. By the beginning of the 1920s, the Tahitian period was not the only one to attract the connoisseurs and the attention of the public. A number of publications at the time, dubbed Gauguin the founder of synthetism and symbolism. While France remained divided, between fascination and rejection, foreign art lovers were showing an active interest in Gauguin, who enjoyed a very different reputation in their countries. In 1926, the French Art Association organized an important exhibition in Copenhagen, Stockholm, and Oslo, consisting of 76 pictures, all of which, except for one, belonged to Scandinavian collections. These days, paintings by Gauguin are rarely offered for sale, their price is reaching tens of millions of US dollars in the sale room when they become available. Gauguin's 1892 painting, When Will You Marry?, became the world's third most expensive artwork when its owner sold it privately for 210 million US dollars in September 2014. The buyer is believed to be the Qatar Museum. Gauguin is considered a post-impressionist painter. His bold, colorful, and design-oriented paintings significantly influenced modern art. Artists and movements in the early 20th century inspired by him include Vincent van Gogh, Henri Matisse, Pablo Picasso, Georges Braque, André Derain, Fauvism, and Cubism, among others. While Gauguin made important contributions to art history, he also often behaved deplorably in his personal life, revealing something of his behavior in his artwork. Since then, his work has often been exhibited and praised, with little or no acknowledgement of his wrongdoings. Some say there is an argument for focusing on Gauguin's artistic contributions, rather than his personal life. They may contend that the ethical considerations of his personal actions, while important, should not diminish the aesthetic and historical value of his paintings. It is important to note that this view does not condone or excuse Gauguin's actions, but rather seeks to separate the evaluation of his art from his personal life. The controversy surrounding Gauguin's relationships with young girls in French Polynesia, and the ethical implications of his behavior, continue to prompt ongoing debate among art historians and scholars to this day.